Welcome back. We're going to look at healthcare today. Now, this is probably the one with the most amount of data um, because it's one of the biggest areas that Aboriginal people face social exclusion. So without further ado, let's get cracking. Remember, don't forget to start. Why is healthcare an important socially valued resource and which human right does it relate to? Again, making sure that you can check up here. Hmm. There we go. This is why it's important. It improves life expectancy, your outcomes, and supports your overall physical and mental well-being. And this is the article um, that it relates to. Everyone has the right to medical care and necessary social services and the right to security even in the event of sickness. Okay, So everyone has the right to medical care. That's the big um, takeaway factor there. So if everyone has the right to it, does that mean everyone gets it equally? Absolutely not, and that's what we're gonna look at now. So, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, good health, it's more than just the absence of disease or illness, it's also a very holistic concept um, for Aboriginal people that includes their physical health, their social, cultural, emotional, and spiritual well-being as well, not only for themselves, but for the community too. So healthcare, for us, we typically view it as, um, or in Western society, very much about the physical um, health, you know, the how well the body's doing and ticking over. Uh, more recently, we have a bit more concept of this idea of mental health, but typically that's where a lot of it stops um, in general, generally speaking, in Western culture, whereas for Aboriginal people, healthcare is a lot more. It's cultural, it's spiritual, and it can be social as well. So, we're going to try to look at a few aspects of that with some of our data below. But most of this data is very much related to that physical um, health aspect there because that's a lot of what is recorded. So, we'll start off with the, probably the most um, obvious one. That's the life expectancy. So, this is the sort of stat similar to the justice system where it's one you don't want to get wrong. So, it's really important to note. Um, just because it's sort of common knowledge amongst HSC markers. So life expectancy for um, males is, is always lower compared to females because um, we tend to not think with our brain sometimes. Um, so for males it's 71 for Aboriginal males and 75 for Aboriginal females. And then uh, for non-Indigenous is 81 for males and 85 for females. So I don't know if you want to write M above there and F there to indicate that. Um, but that's huge, man. that's significantly low, that's 10 years, that's 10 year gap. It's a massive 10 year gap, 10 years of quality life you're not getting just by being born um, as an indigenous person in Australia. It's rough, that's a, that's a big stat there. And that's one, like I said, that you don't really wanna get wrong because it's very, it's almost common knowledge that um, 10 years um, gap there. Infant mortality, however, um, before I talk about infant mortality, um, infant mortality means, I don't know if you want to draw an arrow on the side here, um, is a death within the first year of a life. So um, Patrick currently is still within the first year of his life. Um, he's nearly made it past the, the stat there. Um, God, that sounded really morbid, didn't it? Um, anyway, um, but uh, infant mortality is relating to death um, within the first year of, of life. So it's three times more likely as an Indigenous individual. So the stat here is six deaths per 1,000 compared to non-Indigenous, where there's only two deaths per 1,000. And again, if you go to the Northern Territory, uh, the rate doubles, or more than doubles, of its own Indigenous counterpart. So the Northern Territory is 13 in 1,000. Um, and that's, that's, quite, that's quite high when you think about it. Um, why do you think that might be that in the Northern Territory it's um, a lot higher? Um, now the six, six times more likely, sorry, relates to the um, two deaths per 1,000 of the non-Indigenous. Okay, so if you want to draw an arrow between there and there, just across like that, would be good or up above like that. Um, 
the reason you probably thought about it um or one of the reasons that there's there's a lot of reasons um the northern territory is in a really bad state right now um is one but the rural and remote aspect of being in the northern territory is particularly a big reason why um there's not many gps around there's, there's no not many major hospitals um so you know if you're living in um, Alice Springs or, or another rural and remote community and you need to give birth or you need to see the doctors in an emergency you know it's often a three four five hour drive to get to your nearest healthcare professional so um, and even when you do see them you know because there's so little of them in the state um, there's queues um, and they can be really hard to access so that is uh, a really sad uh, statistic there and again evidence of disproportionate social exclusion um, Aboriginal people experience what they call a burden of disease that is two times, uh, 2.3 times the rate of non-Indigenous Australians. So what this means above here, burden of disease, if you draw a little arrow, is that they're more likely to contract um, illness or health uh, conditions um, in a big general sweep. So more likely to get a cold, more likely to um, be asthmatic, more likely to uh, have hearing issues um, is a big one there as well. So they're 2.3 times more likely to get any sort of type of disease or illness. If we look at smoking, which is another key healthcare um, indicator that a lot of countries measure the health of their you know, constituents. So nearly half, 43% of Indigenous Australians over 18 smoke daily, compared to 15% of non-Indigenous smokers. So three times um, you know, I'm only 2% off, but you, you're pretty much three times more likely to smoke um, as an Aboriginal person, okay? We all know the dangers um, of smoking. Um, we all know the impact that that can have on your life course and the quality of your life. Um, you know, again, that's probably part of the reason why life expectancy is much lower. 44% of Indigenous mothers smoke during pregnancy compared to 11% of non-Indigenous mothers. So that's four times more likely um to to smoke um if you're pregnant now i think before people go a bit too crazy about this one you know how can they not know that you know how dangerous is that um it is really dangerous and, and it's absolutely awful that this still happens um even this of non-indigenous you know you'd think oh more educated would understand more um it's still a scary stat but here i think that's the big key thing that I alluded to was, was I think, a lack of education. Um, if you're living in rural and remote areas and schools are locked down um, and parents have never been to school because they're part of the stolen generation um, from their previous grandparents, they may have no idea the harm, harmful effects that smoking can have um, on themselves, but let alone their, their unborn children. So I think a lack of education there through no fault of their own this isn't to say that some of them don't know that's bad. I'm not saying that at all. But I think overarching, you will find the reason is, um, and I know it is because I've read about it, is is the lack of education there. Um, and that's part of the long-lasting effects of intergenerational trauma that's happened from the stolen generations. Um, and the idea of a, a lack of education around that. Because you even think when we looked at SVRs and education, one of the big things with social exclusion was that in rural and remote communities where... Um, there's a much higher population of Aboriginal people living there that the schools are shut down more often than they are open, um, you know, and it's part of the school curriculum that would teach this and it might be the first time that these families are hearing about the dangerous um, impacts that smoking can have, um, not only on themselves, but during pregnancy as well. So, um, again, another reason probably why infant mortality is much higher um, here. So you can see how this is all linking. Um, indigenous Australians, they consume more alcohol than non-Indigenous Australians, and this is across um, <coughs> every single metric, whether it's a lifetime um, risk where you're looking at the sort of the standard amount of drinks over a day over a, a long period of time, or whether you're looking at binge drinking and binge risk taking here. So for the lifetime risk, um, the idea that people who drink more than two standard drinks a day um, is when you're at a lifetime risk of um, problems associated with your health due to consumption of alcohol. 
it's 19% for Aboriginal Australians and 15% for non-Aboriginal Australians, so still higher here. So about 25% more, um, more likely there. Whereas if we look at the binge drinking, so this is 11 more, 11 or more standard drinks in one day, at least once a month. Um, Aboriginal people are three times more likely. If you want to write that here, that's the stat there. So 6% of the non-Indigenous population do this, 18% of Aboriginal population does this. So um, that's three times more likely there. Again, probably another reason that contributes to lower life expectancy. When you're blind drunk, you make stupid decisions. Um, on average, the rate of alcohol-related deaths um, was pretty much 24 per 100,000 for Aboriginal populations compared with uh, about five um, per 100,000 for non-Indigenous. So this is huge. This is five times more likely to die um, from alcoholism if you're Aboriginal Australian. Now, the one thing I will say with this is, is I think the lack of education point that I made here regarding smoking um, also rings true here in terms of drinking. Um, but I really do think, and when we start talking about these illicit drug um, and drug-related deaths, actually, I'll make the point when I get there. Um, just bear with me. 39% of Indigenous Australians, they use illicit drugs in the last 12 months compared to 17% of non-Indigenous, so you're more than two times more likely to use um, illicit drugs, so that's um, drugs that are considered illegal, so this isn't like, you know, Panadol or Ibuprofen. Um, you know, we're talking... MDMA, um, heroin, ice, all that sort of stuff. Um, caps, pills, whatever. Illicit drugs, two times more likely. And then the idea of an unintentional drug-related death. Um, so, you know, OD um, is almost three times more higher uh, for Indigenous Australians than for non-Indigenous. So you have about 17% for Aboriginal Australians, so if you want to at see there, compared to 6%, and then maybe a little arrow and non-Indigenous there. Um, now the point I was going to make here above, I think, like I said, lack of education here is definitely one aspect, similar to how it is with the Indigenous um, smoking rates, but I think, and again, I don't think I know from what I've read, um, that if you have been part of stolen generations um, and you have intergenerational trauma passed down from grandparent to parent to kid a lot like what does any person do whether you're aboriginal or not if you've had a really traumatic um, experience in your life and that um, that trauma is then kind of imprinted on you from birth in your physical dna remember how we looked at that in year 11 but also not within your dna you know how that trauma affects how someone's parents might behave in a certain situation, their distrust of police because, um, you know, their, their grandparents were stolen um, by police, you know, in their own lifetime. I think, like, anyone who has a really traumatic experience, um, sometimes we as people don't cope the best with it and we turn to things like alcohol um, or people turn to things uh, like illicit drugs as a coping mechanism. Um, and if you're someone who's more likely to experience trauma, someone who's more likely to experience um, violence, more likely to experience social exclusion at large, you know, overcrowded housing, like we looked at last lesson, if we're looking at the justice system when you get out of jail um, and no one wants to give you a job, you know, that's, that's not good for your mental health. Um, it's not good for your uh, physical health even either. We know, you know, people in, in jail are... Um, often malnourished if we look at you know the stats compared to indigenous and non-indigenous there like we did in that lesson that's evident there so what I, what I guess what I'm trying to get across is that all of these different metrics um, come into play here when we're talking about um, alcohol consumption or over alcohol consumption and, and use of illicit drugs being much higher is that it's a it's a coping mechanism for, for trauma um, and that's intergenerational and so all these deaths from alcoholism, from ODing. Yes, lack of education is part of it as well, for the similar reasons that we discussed with smoking, um, but it's also a, a, a coping mechanism. 
um, indigenous clients traveled about one hour or longer to experience any medical treatment um, compared to um, only 13% of people in non-indigenous having a travel time of one or longer. So it takes longer to um, get to a healthcare professional and to see them. And like I said, that probably particularly plays a role in infant mortality where you really need to act quick um, to fix a lot of issues there. Aboriginal Australians only have a 50% cancer survival rate compared to 65% of non-Indigenous. Um, so again, see so 15% uh, more likely there. So further to that though, five of 1,000, pardon me, um, Aboriginal Australians are diagnosed with cancer compared to four in 100,000 for non-Indigenous. So 20% more likely on that stat there to get a cancer diagnosis if Aboriginal Australian. Again, all of that's probably feeding into lower life expectancy here. Um, and then if we're looking at cancer as well, um, we know that smoking um, is one of the, the leading causes of, of cancer diagnosis um, for people in Australia. Um, among the total Aboriginal, um, among the total Aboriginal po population in Australia, um, 38% it's estimated have some form of disability which impacts their everyday life. Now, whether that's a really severe one or a lighter or moderate one that still impacts their life, um, they're sitting at about 38%. So about a bit over a third compared to only 16% of non-Indigenous. So you're two times more likely to develop um, a disability if you are Aboriginal Australian. So you could put that in there too, that'd be good just to make it clear. 31% uh, of Indigenous Australians reported high or very high levels of psychological distress compared to 14% of non-Indigenous. So you're more than two times more likely to develop some kind of mental health condition as an Aboriginal Australian. And when we're looking at psychological distress, again, intergenerational trauma is a really big key factor there. But you can also imagine the systemic racism that you, you would face on a daily basis would just grind you down day after day. It would be horrible, horrible experience. Um, so you probably int annotate uh, intergenerational trauma there. This next stat is, is quite heavy, um, but I, I'll, I'll continue to read it out. So 72% of Aboriginal women experience domestic violence and are 34 times as more likely to be hospitalised for family-related violence or assault compared to non-Indigenous females. So the numbers are 685 per 100,000 compared to 19.9. We might as well just call that 20. Versus 20 per 100,000. So what this means is, again, 34 times more likely. That's massive. That's huge stuff. 34 times more likely to be hospitalised um, for family-related assault women. So 72% of women um, that are Aboriginal experience domestic violence. Indigenous males, when you compare it, are 32 times as likely to be hop hospitalised for family violence compared to as likely. That should be more likely. Can you change that, please? Um, more likely to be hospitalised for family violence compared to non-Indigenous um, males. Again, 7.8. We can just call that 8. And the scariest stat, <laughs> I think, of all is that in the Northern Territory, again, when we look at the Northern Territory, it's a lot higher. One of the reasons for this we're going to look at later on in a lesson called the Northern Territory Intervention. <coughs> that's still happening today. But in the Northern Territory, the rate of hospitalisation due to domestic violence is up to 86 times higher for Aboriginal women. So here it's 34% across the country. In the Northern Territory alone, it's 86 times higher for Aboriginal women when you compare it to non-Aboriginal women. Um, now again, a lot of these other things would feed into it. Um, a lot of the alcoholism that we're looking at here 
would definitely feed into that. We know that alcoholism is a, across any, um, whether you're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, um, a lot of domestic violence and family-induced violence is as a result of alcoholism. Um, but the fact that 72%, um, that's massive. That's huge. Um, and if it's 86 times higher um, in the Northern Territory, affects males as well. So being hospitalised due to violence is, is a really big issue um, amongst Aboriginal Australians. And if you look at, again, the cycle, and we link this to the... And again, through no, no fault of their own. If you, if you look at a culture that's been dispossessed um, from, from their own law, uh, and way of living for, for generations and, and thousands of years and are forced to adopt to a new way of doing things um, in such a short amount of time, that would take its toll. Um, and if you look at the, um, again, higher rates of alcoholism used as a coping mechanism uh, for intergenerational trauma, even if you think back to the other SVRs we're looking at in terms of um, the justice system and the racial profiling, um, that is perpetuated by our justice system certainly doesn't help. Um, if we again look at the lack of education there, if we look at um, healthcare statistics that we're seeing in terms of more likely to have uh, a mental health disorder and psychological distress, high or very high, all of this feeds into this um, abhorrent statistic down the bottom here. Now, moving on. Healthcare implications in relation to life chances for Aboriginal people. There are four main areas I put forward, although you could argue a case for almost any of these here. Um, the first one, obviously, that we always start with is the human rights abuse. So this human right here is that everyone has the right to medical care and necessary social services and the right to security in the event of sickness. Now, the big one here, everyone has a right to medical care. If we look at the disproportionate social exclusion in regards to medical care, all the stats are here, but to sum it up, they travel an hour longer on average to get to any medical healthcare professional. They experience higher rates of cancer and a decreased um, change, that should be chance. Can you change that please? And decreased chance of survival from any chronic health condition that we have. Um, furthermore, you're five times more likely to develop alcoholism um, combined with women, th 34 times more likely to experience domestic violence with men, um, 32 times more likely. And the right for security due to sickness for Aboriginal people um, is a human rights breach. Um, and if we, you could even add to this as well, um, forms of disability that we look at here, um, you know, 38% time, 38% uh, um, of Aboriginal people um, develop some form of disability. You could look at even the life expectancy being 10 years lower um, as a human rights breach. There is not equal right or access to medical care when there is that big of a disproportionate gap across so many different healthcare metrics and measurements. Okay, It's social exclusion and definitely impacts their life chances quite literally. Yeah. Um, Indigenous peoples as well, they don't have equal opportunity to be as healthy as non-Indigenous Australians, which I think is another big um, implication for their life course, is that they don't have the equal opportunity. There's no um, equality at a base level. There's certainly no equity. There's certainly no justice. But even the very first level where we look at equality, it's just not there at all. Um, and we can see this in all our stats here. But the relative socioeconomic disadvantage experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when you compare it to non-Indigenous, that also places them at greater risk of exposure to behavioural and environmental health risks. Um, those behavioural and environmental health risk factors such as high accounts of domestic violence, um, drug and alcohol abuse um, as well, as does the higher proportion of Indigenous households that live in conditions that don't support um, good health. Okay. Indigenous peoples also do not enjoy equal access to primary health care and infrastructure. Um, and this, I think I've linked a lot of, some of it to um, the housing, but also other things, safe drinking water, effective sewage systems, rubbish collection services and healthy housing. If you look at here, tell me where, where's the effective sewage system here? Where's the power here? 
where's um, you know clean drinking water coming from is there um, electricity lines connected is there underground sewage systems here I don't I don't think there is more than likely there's one outhouse toilet here that has to be physically um, emptied each day um, probably is on a manual flush too so where are you getting the water to fill that manual flush in um, you know it's it's a lot of those little things that you don't realize um, which which shows you that there's definitely no equal opportunity um, to be as healthy as non Aboriginal um, people and it's evident in all the stats here another point would be the inaccessibility of mainstream services and lower access to health services as well so this is primary health care so things like hospitals um, and the proper health infrastructure there is significantly lacking particularly when we look at the rural and remote areas where over 50% of Aboriginal people live um, this in itself is a significant barrier if you can't access healthcare um, how can you expect to be as healthy as um, people that can access it you simply can't okay infant mortality is higher as a result um, the education insurance smoking which the healthcare can help with uh, wouldn't be there um, driving up to an hour for an appointment um, when you're obviously if we look at income not earning what 286 bucks I think it was a week in household income and you then have to drive an hour there and an hour back minimum to get to your appointment you know you're using half your weekly income on the fuel costs alone let alone the pharmacy where you may need um, a prescription drug medicine which is going to cost you money let alone the GP and doctor's appointment which might cost money too oh and then by the way you still have to feed your family that week based on the, you know the 10 bucks that you have left over um, so it's just it's abhorrent it's really really rough and then the last thing here is that the gap in the disease burden which we looked at so you're two times more likely to to get any sort of kind of disease or illness if you're Aboriginal Australian and I think that's due to a range of factors disconnection from culture traditions and countries as well um, but also and social exclusion in that regard but also the increased use of um, tobacco and smoking alcohol and other drugs they're really key factors here which um, impact that disease burden you know if you're smoking you're more likely to develop cancers and other diseases if you're and not necessarily just cancer but even like gum disease just from all the cigarettes if we're looking at uh, liver failure and things like that through alcoholism and stuff like that um, this of course disproportionately creates social exclusion and is really reflected in the in the life expectancy and infant mortality there um, so yeah there's a lot of stats here for healthcare it's one of the I mean I say this about every SVR it's one of the bigger ones um, they're all big um, last but not least with this practice HSC question I want you to give it a go and I've left um, but not this week um, I have left some space here as well for I want you guys to do a bit of writing feedback to each other in a second um, but I'm aware that you uh, have your assessment uh, this week and so you can do that the week after um, so yeah that's it for healthcare thank you